This show is sponsored by BetterHelp Online Therapy. Without a healthy mind, being happy is hard. Visit betterhelp.com super and see if online therapy is for you. Hey, brother! Guys, it's a question we have tackled in the past, trying to figure out which monster was scaring which other child inside of the Pixar universe. It's one of my favorite kind of videos to make. The only issue is that so many of the kids in the Pixar universe are just like too brave to have had monsters. Like, I just can't imagine anyone being able to scare any of like the par kids. Can you? Or like Merida, for example. The movie's literally called Brave. But with the release of Luca, we have a new candidate for Kid with a Monster, Julia. Santa Mozzarella, eyes up! And obviously Luca and Alberto don't have monsters because they're already, uh, you know, monsters. So that'd be really funny if like the monster came in the room and like, oh crap! And yeah, I know what you're thinking. Julia spends most of the movie with Luca and Alberto and accepts their monsterness almost immediately. Like, do I really think she would be scared by a monster in her closet? Yes. Yes, I do. And I think I know who it is. The Pixar Theory, the Pixar Theory. We're finally going to see it clearly. The Pixar Theory. Guys, before we dive on in, we need to give a huge thank you to today's sponsor, MeUndies. Okay, okay, okay. So you know how like whenever you're nervous, the universal advice is just picture everyone in their underwear. Now don't get me wrong, imagination is a beautiful thing, but when it comes to underbritches, I am 10 times more in favor of just actual comfort. I mean, why is picturing other people making you comfortable? Why not just wear actual comfortable underwear? That way you can feel ready to take on anything. No half naked room necessary. And that's what MeUndies does. They make the softest, most comfortable undies with the funnest prints to make you feel comfortable at your core. They're designed to be the softest thing on, dare we say it? The whole planet. Yeah, baby bottoms, old news. The new phrase is softer than a pair of MeUndies, which I guess you do also wear on your bottom. Bottoms be soft, y'all. MeUndies signature micromodal fabric literally grows from trees, making their undies not only super soft, but also sustainable. And they offer different cuts because they get it. We got different butts. Check out their undies, socks, bralettes, loungewear, and more, ranging from sizes extra small to 4XL. For me, honestly, it's been pairing the MeUndies quality with their subscription plan. I can slowly and easily build out a collection of top drawer, <laughs> no pun intended, no, I'm kidding, it was intended. Top drawer drawers that I can look forward to wearing each and every day. And MeUndies has a great offer for all of our viewers. If this is your first purchase, you get 15% off and free shipping. And to get that 15% off plus free shipping and a 100% satisfaction guarantee, you can head over to MeUndies.com slash theories. Again, that is MeUndies.com slash theories. Link is in the description down below. Okay, so first things first is figuring out which generation of scarers and or jokesters we might be looking at. Like, who are the list of candidates to even be Julia's monster? Luca takes place in the 1950s slash 60s, so does that mean it's a much older generation of monster, like the one Mike sees when he's a kid? Or could it be maybe some of the ones that he and Sully see when they visit Monsters, Inc. in the middle of the night at college? How do we whittle it down? Great question, and it all has to do with how time travel works in the Pixar theory. Which, by the way, if you're familiar with the Pixar theory and that Boo was the witch and the witch is a whittler, that sentence was really clever, so good job, self. But time travel in Pixar is different than time travel in other stories, because you might be thinking, well, hey, if it's time travel, can't they just travel back to any point in time? Couldn't it still be any generation? But no, according to the Pixar theory, the monsters exist on a parallel timeline and can only travel a set distance into the past. So as time moves forward in the monster world, it also moves forward in the human world. The monsters can't keep traveling to the same day over and over again. They are stuck traveling to the moment in time that is currently available to them. Kids these days, they just don't get scared like they used to. Exactly, Water News, you get it, because now there's a new generation of kids. The great news about this, though, is that if we can just establish a point in time on both sides of the door, then we can just move the slider up and down and it'll always line up. And guess what? We can totally do this thanks to some helpful information provided in Monsters Incorporated. Namely, this folder, or as I like to call it, the Fountain of Information. It has got all sorts of fun 
information in it about the child that Sully is going to be scaring first thing that morning. But what I'm looking at here are all of the dates right here that show all the times this child has been scared before. And as you can clearly see, all of those dates took place in 1999, about four to six days apart, suggesting that the time this time they're going to be scaring him is again only four to six days apart from the last time he was scared. Which is really just a long way of saying that on the monster side of the door, it is the monster's version of 1999. As for the human side of the door, it's a little bit harder to gauge, but we have a pretty good guess thanks to some extremely prevalent posters in multiple kids' rooms. Specifically here and here and here. You know what all these posters have in common? Is that they're from a series of actual real life posters that were printed to promote the grand opening of Disneyland. And look, if it was just one Disneyland poster in one random kid's room, that would be great. But it's not. It's multiple Disneyland posters in multiple kids' rooms. Which is odd. Like, how likely do you think it is that so many kids from different places simultaneously have posters from the same series of posters promoting the opening of one very specific park? Answer? Very unlikely. Unless it just so happens that it's the very year Disneyland opened and it's the new coolest place on Earth and they all want to go, which is why they all happen to have a poster from the same series of posters. To me, that is the only thing that makes sense and accounts for this weird occurrence. And great news, we know when Disneyland opened here in the human world. It was 1955, which thankfully establishes us a point on the human side of the doors. What the monsters called 1999 on their side of the door travels to what we call 1955 on our side of the door. And everything otherwise moves forward at the exact same rate. Got it? So now all we need to do is figure out when Luca is taking place and then we can just work backwards. And thankfully there are even more posters in Luca that help us determine the exact date. Namely, all of the posters you can see for the various Italian movies around town. Here you can see 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, which came out in 1954. Here is Roman Holiday, which came out in 1953. And here is La Strada, which also came out in 1954. But the one that's really helpful actually isn't a poster. It's the movie this old woman is watching right here. This movie is called Big Deal on Madonna Street, and it came out in 1958. This is the latest release date of any of the movies that we see throughout the town, which means it has to at least be this year. Although to be fair, it could be any year after that, like up to 1969. But since all the other posters in town are from movies in the 50s, I feel like it makes more sense that it's still the 50s. And this being the latest concrete waypoint we have to work off with, I'm going with Luca takes place in 1958. Which means that back on the monster timeline, it would be 2002, which is interesting because it means that the scare floors would have been switched over to the laugh floors. However, that does not mean we are looking for a jokester because we also know that Julia is 13 in Luca. And the oldest known age of a kid of a monster, at least that we are aware of, thanks to the folder of information is Eight. So it's pretty likely that Julia has aged out of her monster by the time Luca is actually taking place. But if we roll the calendar back five years to when Julia would have been eight, that makes the year in Italy 1953. Which would bring us to 1997 on the monster side of the door and right in the middle of Sully's prime. Well, Sully and all of his co-workers who we see entering the scare floor with him at the beginning of Monsters, Inc. In fact, if you use the scare cards that came out with Monsters University, you can see how long each monster on the floor has been an active scarer. And we know that the last year listed on their card is the year from the start of the movie, so we can just look at that and then work backwards. Which I did for all of them on this lovely chart. The green line is the year in question and shows who was active when Julia was eight. Unfortunately, it was all of them. So uh, that didn't end up eliminating much for us. That said, I am willing to allow for a one to two year margin of error for what year Luca is actually taking place in, which would at least eliminate Nick Schmidt and Pete Ward, who only just became active right at the end of Julia's eligibility for a scarable child. And honestly, I'm betting she had a long-term monster based on the line Just let me do the talking and act casual. He doesn't deal with fear. That to me sounds like Julia has seen her dad, Massimo, deal with her being scared 
a lot. Combine that with his innate distrust and dislike of sea monsters, and it sounds to me like at some point he caught a glimpse of whoever her monster is. But even getting rid of Nick and Pete, that still leaves us with Sully, Randall, George, Bob, Joe, Ricky, Ted, Harry, Augustus, and Josh. I love how they all have such regular names. And I'll admit, from here, I was a little perplexed as to how to move forward. Like, what made any of these more or less likely to be Julia's monster? And let me just tell you, I examined her room for a while, which we actually get to see from several angles, but it's so tiny, there's just not much to gleam from it. I mean, she has this Donald Duck toy, which I guess helps line up with the Disneyland recently opening idea, and maybe means she's not afraid of duck looking things, but that's uh, none of them again, so that doesn't help. Ugh, I cannot tell you, it was really so frustrating because the room is so small and there was so much stuff crammed in there, you'd think something would offer a hint, but that's when it hit me, you guys, the size of the room. It's not the question, it's the answer. There is no spoon. The files are in the computer. Here's the thing. How many of those monsters could even fit in this room? Honestly, not many. And just look around, there are so many books piled up everywhere that even if you're a trained professional scaring monster, it would be super easy to just like bump into something and knock it over. Which, and I'm not sure if you need reminding, but monsters do not like touching human things. 2319, we have a 2319. <laughs> Now, all that said, I should also mention that Julia is a bit of an odd case as far as scaring goes. Because the room we see her in is not actually even her main room. Like, she only lives with her dad during the summer. The other three quarters of the year, she lives at her mom's house. Which got me wondering, like, how do the monsters deal with kids with multiple rooms? Would it be a different monster for a different place? Because, honestly... I kind of doubt it. I mean, let's take another look at the fountain, sorry, folder of information again. They've got room maps, race, known fears, fear valve adjustments based on scream decibels, average scream yield, whether or not you're a bedwetter. Which I gotta say, that makes me feel real bad. Like it's bad enough they're scaring kids, but how bad would it make you feel if somewhere out there someone has on file, in paperwork, that you're a bedwetter and is using it against you? The point is, the monsters are paired with the kids on many, many levels, and somehow I doubt they're just sort of like cross-pollinating on this regard. So, to that end, whichever monster is coming into the room to scare Julia at her dad's house couldn't be that big because there's just not enough room in the room. And, and, just like besides that, look at her dad. Look, look at this guy. You think size is what's gonna scare Julia? I don't think so. I don't think so. Either way, just based on size alone, I think we can safely eliminate Sully, George, Bob, Joe, Ricky, Ted, and Augustus. Leaving us with just Randall, Harry, and Josh, a much more manageable pool of candidates. But do any of them in particular stand out? Well, Josh and Harry do both have the like squid tentacle looking arms, which would totally match up with the whole sea monster vibe. So there's that. However, I think there can be no doubt that Julia's actual true monster is none other than Randall Boggs. For one, let's revisit that scene where we first meet Massimo and discover his hatred of sea monsters. Why he hates them is not particularly known, but remember what we said earlier about how he doesn't handle a scared Julia very well? And that that might be because he caught a glimpse of her monster once upon a time? Well, do you know which monster it might be easy to only catch a glimpse of because he's super good at camouflage? Randall. And look at the latest sea monster clipping he's stabbing to the wall. Which monster would you say it also kind of looks like? Randall. Massimo lives in a town that is superstitious about sea monsters and also caught a glimpse of Randall once scaring his daughter, who happens to look like all of the bad photos people managed to take of the sea monsters in the town. That's why he hates them. But that said, Julia herself actually scoffs at the notion of sea monsters. 
Everyone in Fortaleza pretends to believe in sea monsters. She says this because she knows the truth. Real monsters come out of your closet, not the ocean. Turns out they're both right. But just watch her reaction to seeing Alberto for the first time in his Randall-esque sea monster form. Utter terror, almost like she is reliving an old nightmare come back to haunt her because in that moment, she thinks Randall is back. And honestly, how fitting, right? Like the main villain from Monsters, Inc. is scaring one of the main characters as a kid from another Pixar movie. <coughs> Randall, that guy is the worst. The other thing I really love about this idea though is the relationship between Julia and Massimo. Again, he doesn't handle Julia being scared very well, but I think despite appearances, he is massively empathetic to the feelings of his daughter. I don't want you doing the race again. You get so upset. He hates sea monsters because he believes they scared his daughter. But interestingly, at the end of the movie, he is also the very first one to come around to Alberto and Luca after they're revealed as sea monsters. And personally, I think this is because Massimo can very clearly see that his daughter is not afraid of them. And if she's not scared of them, then they're not a threat. And if they're not a threat, then he doesn't hate them. It's just like he trusts her judgment so much and I love it. Also, I love that it means Randall's scares are being undone by the monsters of Luca. Like that guy's legacy is melting more and more each day. Also, also, I feel like this is worth mentioning just because this always seems to come up whenever we're making one of these videos, but each monster scares many, many children. Like if you're sitting there saying, wait, no, Randall can't be Julia's monster because he's Boo's monster. Like he can be both. Randall is many, many kids monster. But anyway, guys, that is our theory, not just for who Julia's monster is, but also why Massimo hates sea monsters. But what do you think? Do you think there is a better candidate? Let me know your thoughts in the towel section down below. But guys, thanks so much for watching today's video. Don't forget to hit that like button if you haven't already and subscribe so you don't miss any future Pixar theory action from us. If you want to see what happened to Alberto's father, you can check out this video right here. But Ben, until next time, I will see you in another life, brother.